Okay. I look about right. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, uh, finish up chapter 11 um, by way of announcements, of course. On Wednesday is going to be exam day, so it's going to be covering 5, 10, and 11. So have no problem covering 11. Get a good, healthy start on 12 today. Um, and then, of course, also for this week, this is case study week for lab, which again, since we're on schedule, we have nothing to make up. We're looking good. So for us, Friday is a down day. So if you don't want to have to uh, show up on Friday afternoon, you don't have to. Play. So the lab exam <coughs> is going to have a bunch of stations set up, set up by the department. So every section takes it all week long. Um, and so basically there will be a series of questions per station and uh, most of the stations are geared toward um, interpretation, right? So like we take a look at some results and test tubes, different colors, things like that. And we ask you a bunch of questions about what these mean. So okay. You're not going to do stuff. Yeah, because there's not enough time to do that. It would basically mean we would have a lab exam with maybe two questions on it because it would take too much time to do that. No. It's individual. Yep. And um, after case study week, then we'll have like a lab review, which is just basically open form. So collect all your thoughts, take a look back on the semester, bring all your questions. That's your chance, the last chance to get all of your questions answered before the lab exam. So it's just kind of like an open end of the semester. Yeah, or whenever sooner you want to give it to me. So it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at, um, so we're talking about meiosis, right? And we've already talked a little bit about some of the, um, like I said, there's three engines of variation in meiosis, right? We talked about one, which was recombination. This is the second one. Now remember, we're kind of answering the question is, do you feel confident that you are the only you that has ever been on the planet that will ever be on the planet, including all 8 billion of us and however many billion of us there are about to come? Are you confident that you will be the only one on the planet? Is it possible to have another you, basically is the question. Well, the answer to that story is, well, it depends. Right, depends on how much variation we're talking about here. All right, well, what are the chances? What are the chances of drawing the lucky U card twice? <clears throat> well, we've already covered one engine of variation, right? That uh, that basically kind of scrambles all this up and kind of makes it impossible to pick U twice. Uh, the first one is recombination. Remember, we talked about all of the things that have to go right for recombination to happen perfectly twice. We're not saying perfectly generally, right? We're just saying for the exact same way for it to happen twice, there's a lot of things that have to happen, right? And a lot of them are random, right? So from the number of chiasma that you place in there to the position of the chiasma, to which one of the recombinants you pick and choose in the first place, to the recombinational events that happened in your mother and, and, and in, in previous descendants, right? So there's a lot of points of randomization. Each one of those is basically a scrambling of your chances, which makes it harder and harder and harder to duplicate any one outcome, right? You being, of course, one of the outcomes. Well, that's just the recombination thing. Now we're gonna be taking a look at the second big engine of variation, that's random assortment, right? So when you take a look at random assortment, we're talking about metaphase one. And in metaphase one, you're basically lining up your homologs in a double file. But if you take a look, here's your metaphase plate going right down the middle. And let's say the mom is red and dad is blue. So in this particular case, right, what are the chances of mom landing on this side? Well, 
100, as opposed to dad, for instance. So mom will land on this side every single time. So here's your pairing, right? This is homologous pairing. So the chances of mom landing on the right side, as opposed to the left is what? Three and one? Nope, keep going. So you have three independent events. What's the chances of any one of these landing in that orientation? What? Thought I heard it. Now one and three. Think quarters. How many how many possibilities do you have? Mm -hmm, just the first two. One half, one half right? Because you have an equal chance of the blue landing on that side as you do the red. All things random, right? If it's random. So basically you have a one half chance. So dad could have ended up there too, too couldn't you? With a one half chance. So think about this. Whether or not you get mom or dad on one side is purely random. The chances for any one mom chromosome or any dad chromosome landing on one side is 50-50, right? So think about this. This is the one, we have two or three chromosomes. We've got, in this particular image, in our cells, we've got 23, right? We've got 22 autosomes plus the sex chromosomes, XX or XY, depending on what we are, right? So then how many different combinations can we get here? Well, it's one half, right? To the 23 which is like some preposterously low number, right? Um, and I think we looked this up once, it turned out to be something like one in 8.3 million chances of any one combination occurring with 23 potential events. So what that basically means is that in one case, you've got mom on one side. In this case, you've got mom, mom, dad, and this one is dad, dad, mom, and this one is mom, dad, dad, and then mom, dad, mom, and, and you kind of get the idea, right? So you can basically scramble this up. Now, this is all random. So you would essentially, in order to make you twice, what you're asking for is for all the events of recombination to happen exactly the same twice. That is to say that the number of chiasma Twice. The position of those chiasma, because remember they can be randomly located across the chromosome. Those have to land exactly the same spot twice. Then, not only that, but you have to, on top of that, randomly assort them the exact same way twice. So just this one alone is like one in eight plus million chances. Then you overlie on top of that that you need the same recombinational pattern to happen again twice. So it's a little far-fetched to say that the recombinational pattern is going to happen the same way ever. But then you add on top of that another one, one in, in eight million plus opportunities, and then both of those compound, right? So the probability of one is multiplied to the probability of another, which the first time around, it was preposterously close to zero. Now it's ridiculously close to zero. Right. So you're talking about a number that is getting so tiny that in a, in a lot of ways to ask for you to happen twice ever, we're not just talking about twice now in all 8, 20 billion, it's 40 billion. This is really popular theory. Right. We're not talking about now. We're talking about ever. We're talking about all of humanity past, all of humanity present, all of humanity future. You will never happen twice. Why? Because what you're asking for is you're asking to basically hit was equivalent to hitting the lottery every day for your entire life. Now, if I were to say, tell me, what are your chances of winning the lottery every day for your whole life? You guys would with confidence say zero. Not only that, but since we're betting, I'm willing to put money on that one, right? Why not? Like some skin in the game. Right. Why? Because you know that that is so preposterously 
uh, ridiculously far-fetched. The probabilities are so close to zero that anybody worth their salt is essentially gonna say this is zero. Now, mathematically, is there a chance? Sure, mathematically, but you know, here's the problem with probability. At some point, you start to sound like dumb and dumb. So you're saying there's a chance. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's zero, right? And no, you don't have a chance, right? So I saw the movie. No, right? Well, we actually did because we're Jim Carrey. But, you know, in reality, right? We know how reality works. No, 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 right? Not no, just no. It's never going to happen, ever. It's never going to happen, right? And that's what this is like. So you're asking to win the genetic lottery like every day for the rest of your life. That's what this is like. But guess what? That's only the second one. Remember I said there was three. So there's another one on top of that. So if it's not already impossible, it gets even more impossible as soon as we add the third one. And we'll add that at the end of the chapter. <laughs> but let's take a look at anaphase one. So remember anaphase one, Remember, your goal here is to separate your homologs. Now, what do you need to do in order to separate your homologs? Well, first of all, you got to resolve your chiasma, right? So you got you have these things that are entangled due to recombination. So you have to resolve that. So you have to resolve the chiasma. Guess what else you have to resolve? You also have to resolve the synaptonemal complex. Right? Because that's holding the homologs together. So all that stuff has to let go in order for these guys to separate. Then you're going to separate the homologs and they're going to go to opposite poles, but the sisters remain attached. So there's no resolution at this point. Of cohesion. If you recall, that's that kind of protein glue that's in between the sisters, kind of sticking these guys together. What? Resolution. Oh, this one? Synaptonemal complex? Yeah, that's synaptonemal complex. So that's that protein complex that's holding the homologs together. So you have to do all that basically to get anaphase. And once you get anaphase going, then you're gonna be separating your homologs. Now notice what's happening here. Notice you have your polar microtubules, right? That are attaching to each of the poles. So that's your push off, right? And then you also have your um, chromosome microtubules. So those ones pulling the chromosomes toward the individual poles, right? So that's an anaphase one. And then once we separate out the homologs, then we're ready to go into telophase. So what's going on in telophase? Well, like what's going on in every telophase, basically you're reversing the order of prophase. So in this case, you are rebuilding your nuclear envelope. So that's one thing. Um, in this case, notice the sisters are no longer identical because they've been recombined, right? So here you have your four genetic, uh, genetically different uh, pieces. Now, here's the thing. You don't necessarily undo all of prophase, and you don't necessarily go into cytokinesis because it kind of depends on what you're going to do next. Okay. So that's the reason why they say, oh, well, cytokinesis may or may not happen. Well, wh when does it may and when does it may not? Well, it's very easy. In us, there's two outcomes, right? There's male and there is female gametogenesis. So when males go through spermatogenesis, what they basically do is they send their individual spermatogonia through meiosis, right? So it goes through meiosis one, separates the homologs. But what happens in gametogenesis in males is that they don't stop. They just basically go right through to meiosis two. They just finish it out. They separate the sisters and they have the four products that have been recombined or not, depending on if you're parental or recombinant. And each one of those four will then develop into a sperm. And then that will be part of the batch, right? The entire batch could range in the hundreds of millions to perhaps even close to billion, okay, of, of individual sperm. So there's a lot of sperm that's being made as a big batch. It's like a big high output kind of a production. So as a result, meiosis does not stop at all. You just, you start it, and you go until you finish it out with meiosis too. So in that case, they are 
the mite not, right? So they don't have to go through cytokinesis because why would you? All you're gonna do is just go right into separating out the sisters and then you go through cytokinesis at the end of TL phase two, okay? Because since you're already condensed, your nuclear envelope's already down, guess what? You're still in the middle of the cell cycle. You're like, hey, why don't we just finish the job, right? Just, just finish it out. And then we'll kind of wrap everything up at the end once we finish it all out. And that's exactly what males do in spermatogenesis. So they don't stop. But in females, it's a different story. In females, what happens is the eggs will go into oogenesis and then they'll start meiosis and then they'll arrest in meiosis one. And at that point then, the female's born. So every female is born with all the eggs that she's ever gonna have. And they're arrested in meiosis one. And then they stay arrested in meiosis one until menopause. So you're talking about some 40, perhaps 50 years worth of arrest in meiosis. Now, because of that arrest, that long-term arrest, what they will do is they'll kind of wrap this up a little bit and kind of go through like a little light cytokinesis to make sure that you kind of protect everything and everything in kind of like a state where it's able to keep well. And so in this case, the females will go into a little bit of a light cytokinesis and a kind of a telophase-ish sort of a cytokinesis sort of thing because they're trying to make sure their eggs are kind of in a storable form that doesn't let them be vulnerable, right? So they just want to kind of keep them protected. So they kind of go through a little bit of a light cytokinesis. And there they will stay <clears throat> until they're basically called up during puberty. And then every month until you go into menopause, they're called up, okay? And so it's only then when they're called up to go through follicular development that they begin to re-pick up where they left off, which is they continue out meiosis one, and then they go through meiosis two, and then they stop there. And then they stay there until they're fertilized. And if they're fertilized, they finish up meiosis two, fuse with the male pronucleus, and then off we go, where is that? If they don't, then you just slough them off with the rest of the uterine lining um, every month. But because of the arrest situation that females have, and the way they do things a little bit differently than males, they will go through a little bit more of a kind of a cytokinesis type of a packaging strategy uh, for all their eggs to make sure that they are in good shape. So it's kind of what it looks like. You can see it looks like a basic telophase. You can see the cells are starting to sort of pull apart and then you're forming a nuclear envelope. Now, what about meiosis two? <coughs> This is the equational division. And the goal here is to separate your sisters. Guess who, uh, what other cell cycle strategy also separates the sisters? Mitosis. As a matter of fact, meiosis two and mitosis are spot on identical. So much so that I spend nearly next to no time whatsoever covering it because we just spent an entire chapter covering this very same thing. So in prophase two, same basic issue, right? Nuclear envelope breakdown, spindle migration, chromosomes are already condensed, right? So they're already there. You line them up in single file, right? So one of the innovations of meiosis is that in meiosis in metaphase one, you are in double file. That's the reason why you're able to separate the homologs. And meiosis two, you're in single file, so you're separating the sisters, right? So you're kind of going right down the middle there. And then as you separate the um, anaphase wise, you're separating each individual sister to their respective corners, if you will. And then you go through a terminal telophase now at this particular point. So now you do reverse everything. You decondense the chromosome. Um, you're going to rebuild the nuclear envelope. And then eventually you're going to move into a cytokinesis that's going to pop these cells apart. And your final result is your four haploid genetically non-identical cells. Now for us, basically these cells will then develop into gametes. <coughs> and then of course we talked about the alternation of generations, right? 
where the moths will actually, in some cases, uh, produce like a haploid body versus a diploid body. And for them, then their gamete production will be dividing by mitosis, right? So that's just kind of like a little bit of a, a backward look at what we covered with, with the alternation of generations, that whole life cycle between haploid body and diploid body that we saw with mosses. So what if we screw it up? Uh, well, that's bad news. <laughs> uh, because we already talked about this a little bit, didn't we? We already talked a little bit about this in um, chapter 10. So one of the things in meiosis is meiosis has to be balanced and symmetrical. What happens if it's not balanced and symmetrical? Well, if it's not balanced and symmetrical, what's going to happen is you're going to get a lopsided division, right? So you're going to get a bunch of stuff on one side, not enough on the other. When you get that, that is our non-disjunction. Remember, we talked a little bit about that uh, when we were talking about sort of the balance of tensions at that uh, metaphase checkpoint, at the spindle checkpoint, trying to make sure that everything's balanced tension-wise. Well, this is the reason why, because bad things happen if you're not balanced and symmetrical. It leads to what we refer to as aneuploidy. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. What is that? It's basically either missing or extra chromosomes. And we talked about that a little bit at the beginning of chapter 10, didn't we? About the fact that animals do not have a tolerance at all for having extra or missing chromosomes. We also learned this about this in lab, right? So the reason why you guys were going through your little fourth grade cutouts of your chromosome squash, which is probably at this point, probably more like post-traumatic stress uh, disorder at this point for some of you. Right, so notice what we had. We had a list of a bunch of things, right? So we had Edwards, we had Patels, we had Downs, we had Kleinfelter, we had Turners. Some of them, like for instance, were either triple 18, triple 13, triple 21. Some were triple X, some were XXY, some were XO. But basically they were varying sorts of, it was an entire list of aneuploid outcomes where you either had too many or not enough chromosomes. Now on that list, of course, sex chromosomes notwithstanding, because sex chromosomes are a little bit more forgiving than the autosomes, right? Because, I mean, you can live just fine if your sex, chromosomal sex is ill-determined, um, but you can't live just fine if your autosomes are screwed up, right? So there's more penalty for having too many or too little autosomes than there are for too little or too many uh, X chromosomes, okay? But the only one that made it on that list was Downs, right? For the most part, that was the only real viable of all of these aneuploids. And even then, when a lot of times people don't realize this, that a Down syndrome only has a life expectancy like in their 50s. So their life expectancy is cut way down. Um, and so that's a little something that most people don't want to talk about. but it's nevertheless true. And it's so catastrophic that basically this is the most common cause of miscarriage in humans is if you have uh, too many or not enough chromosomes, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna show you how we can get too many or too few chromosomes. There's really two ways to screw this up, right? In meiosis, you got meiosis one, you can either non-disjoin there, or you have meiosis two, or you can non-disjoin there. And your pattern is slightly different. There's definitely a preference if you're talking about more something more forgiving uh, for you. But let's first of all, take a look at non-disjunction of meiosis one. Normally meiosis one is supposed to send your chromosomes, your homologs in this case, to each side, yes? But we're gonna send this one through and uh, meiosis one non-disjunction event. What does that mean? That means everything goes to one side. So one side gets all of it, the other side gets none of it. Now, assuming that meiosis two is the same, and this is fine, you know, that there's nothing wrong with meiosis two, then this guy is going to divide into two cells that have nothing, right? And this guy is going to divide. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna line up in meiosis two, right? In single file. And he's gonna separate the sisters. They're gonna to go to each side. So that's all normal. 
And what's going to happen is you're going to create a cell that looks something like this. So you're looking at it, you're thinking, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> that didn't look like such a problem yet. Think about it. Let's go ahead and mate this to a, a person. Right, let's just take a normal individual mate. We're going to mate these. So if these two get mated, then what's going to happen is this is going to lead to a zygote with one chromosome. Same thing with this one. Zygote with one chromosome. If you take this one, it's going to lead to a zygote with three, and this one as well. So these guys are what's referred to as monosomy, one chromosome, and these guys are trisomy, three chromosomes. For instance, like Down syndrome, free apple 21. But notice, all of your offspring are going to have problems, aren't they? Chances are that uh, you're never going to see the monosomes because, and when you're missing something, it's a lot more catastrophic than when you got too much of something. So, typically speaking, the monosomes we will never see because it is just a catastrophic event. And it's actually pretty catastrophic to have an extra chromosome, it's just a couple of them will squeak by, like trisomy 21. So, that one we'll see. So that's what happens basically if you have a non-disjunction event in meiosis one. But what happens if it happens in meiosis two? So let's go ahead and do this. So we're gonna have a normal meiosis one. <clears throat> so our homologs do just fine. Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a meiosis two non-disjunction. So what does that mean? So that means when When this tries to separate, one of these is going to fail and you're going to get everything to one side. So what does that mean? That means one of these cells is going to have two chromosomes and the other one's going to have nothing. Now this one happens to go normally. So it'll do the normal separation. So you'll have normal and normal. So now if you mate this, you're going to have, in this particular case, normal, normal, trisomy, monosomy. So notice, if it's a meiosis II non-disjunction, at least half of your offspring will be normal. So this is the reason why. If you have to get one, get a meiosis II non-disjunction. Try not to get any, actually. But if you have to get one, right, the more that you can do right in the process, the better off you are, okay, the less of an impact it's going to have. So this is kind of like what meiosis and mitosis look like side by side. So you can see you've got your prophase, all the events of uniqueness are happening in prophase, right? So you basically have your homologous pairing, synapsis, and recombination occurring in prophase one. Um, that's in addition to what's already happening in mitosis, which is nuclear envelope breakdown, chromosome condensation, and spindle migration. Then you move on to metaphase. So here you have your chromosomes aligned in double file, right? So that basically gets you the separation of homologs. And in mitosis, it's single file. So that basically gets you separation of sisters. Then you go through anaphase, where you pull your homologs to either side. And in this case, in mitosis, your anaphase pulls your sisters to either side. And then in meiosis, you may or may not go through cytokinesis, but basically you have uh, your recombined molecules. And in mitosis, you do go through cytokinesis, and so you're done. Okay. But you're only halfway there for meiosis, right? The rest of meiosis is basically recapitulation of mitosis. Notice the alignment in single file and the separation of sisters now, and then the production of four different cells, notice all genetically non-identical. <coughs> these are the two sisters being pulled apart. So these are the same chromosome 
Those are the two sisters being pulled apart. Yes, so that's when you get all that shuffling going on. That's the recombination, and that's only in pro phase one. So, and as a matter of fact, that's actually a good point, right? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of similarities between this and mitosis, more so than differences. There's only really four unique things that are happening in meiosis. Most of them are happening in prophase, right? So you've got homologous pairings, synapses, and recombination that are happening in prophase. And then the other big unique thing is the alignment and double file and metaphase as opposed to single file. Those four are the big major differences between meiosis and mitosis. <coughs> That's the reason why I say you want to learn meiosis well, learn mitosis well first, because it's mostly the same. So here's our big engines of genetic variation. Okay. So the first one we talked about was actually our second engine we talked about was independent assortment, right? So that's basically flipping your coin to figure out where mom and dad lie. Uh, you're on one side or the other. The other one is recombination, right? So actually gene shuffling, all of these have to happen. The third one, what is that? Third one is actually random fertilization. And that's the last one, think about it. In order for you to occur twice, you have to have the exact same recombinational pattern occur. That means that you have to have the exact same position of your chiasma and the exact number of chiasma, both of which are random. Okay. Then in addition to that, that'll give you roughly the same shuffling pattern, but then you need the same random assortment pattern on top of that, right? So you have to basically um, get that one in 8.3 million, but you got to get that twice, right? So that's, that's harder to do, right? And so that turns out to be like, what, one in 64 million to do that twice. So it gets a lot harder to do that twice. But now let's take a look at some of this randomness associated with fertilization. This is kind of like the nail in the coffin of the hopes that there will ever be another unit. Uh, cloning notwithstanding, right? So that's cheating. But anyway, um, right? When you take a look at random fertilization, think about it. Not only are you asking for the exact same recombinational pattern, which is nearly impossible, but you're asking for that in addition to the same random assortment pattern. And then you're asking for those products, which produces four products, you're asking to select the exact four. That is the exact one of those four, right? So if you're a, if you're a male, all four of those meiotic products will be dumped into the overall pool of sperm. So each four represents a different and randomized recombinational pattern. So you're not only asking for the same recombinational pattern, but you're also asking for the exact selection of the exact four of those four, the exact one out of four. But it's worse than that because you've got a whole bunch of other recombinational patterns that happen. You don't just dump four in and deliver four. You dump four, 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 four. four. It's a big pile of all these different recombinational events and patterns all dumped into what is a hundreds and hundreds of millions of sperm. And then when you go to fertilize the egg, when the sperm is left in the female reproductive tract, you're talking about hundreds of millions of sperm which then have to basically go modal. They have to swim up the female reproductive tract into the fallopian tube where they're going to meet the egg that's waiting patiently to be fertilized. And as soon as that first sperm fuses with the egg, the egg shuts off its reception to all of the sperm. So it's called uh, egg insensitivity. This is the reason why you don't have six, seven, eight, nine copies of dad's chromosome is because as soon as that first nucleus, that first sperm fuses with the egg, the egg just shuts it all off and basically denies all other sperm. And so it's just that one, the lucky winner. Well, how do you know who that lucky winner is? Luck. It's random. The selection of that is random. So essentially what you would do is you would have to take essentially the exact sperm and have that one sperm win that race twice out of hundreds of millions of chances. That we're asking, that's a, that is like winning a lottery. Only in this case, not every day of your life, you're asking to win the lottery, in this case, twice. 
What's the chances of winning the lottery twice? Not good, right? So what's the chance of getting the same sperm to actually win the race twice? Not good, right? And that's in addition to what you already have compounded. The fact that we have to have the exact same recombinational pattern, the exact same random assortment. On top of that, it has to be the exact same luck draw of that one sperm with those exact same patterns and random assortment. That has to be the guy who wins the race. The chances of that happening? Zero. You know why? Because we're not done yet. That's just dad. You're asking for the exact same thing from mom. You're asking for the exact same recombinational pattern from her and exactly the same random assortment from her. And you're asking for her to select one of those four products to be the egg that will be you. And not only that, but her random selection of that egg, which has to be exactly the same random uh, re re uh, recombinationally, exactly the same random assortmently, that has to be the same one that has to pair up and meet with the same one from dad. So not only do you have one, two, three random number generators, you've got three on dad's side, you've got three more on mom's side. So you have six different randomized events, each of which have ridiculously small probabilities to each one. And you're asking for all six of them to happen again, twice. Are we comfortable at zero now? Are we laughing at the mathematicians who say, oh, we got a chance? No, you don't. No, you don't, right? So basically, that's the reason why I can say confidently that there has never been a you ever. There is not another you on this planet right now. And there will never be another you ever. So literally, if you think about it, each person is like lightning in a bottle. It's like a one-time event. So if you think about that, that should kind of really, I mean, if you kind of let that sink a little bit, that should kind of make you feel all warm and fuzzy about the, the importance of every single individual person, right? I mean, it sounds a little cheesy, a little hallmarkish, but genetically, there's genetic evidence to suggest that it's not just a bunch of mush and goo, that it's actually scientifically true, that every single person on this planet is irreplaceable. And there will never be another person like you on this planet ever. So if that's not enough to get you to appreciate those that are in your life, then nothing will. Until like the next major like Valentine's Day or whatever. But anyway. Oh, 31. What is that? That's well, way back there. Okay. That one? <laughs> what? So yeah, twins are cheating. So basically, genetically, they're the same. Um, but even with twins, it's not, is it? Because remember, a twin is going to be going through their own meiosis. Now, they may genetically look the same because they're basically, they didn't get the same thing twice. What they got was one thing. And then they just basically split. So most, what we usually think of as identical twins, like especially like monozygotic twins, is basically you take a zygote and when it splits, instead of splitting into two cells, it will become the body cells of an individual. What happens is something in the developmental programming, usually earlier, very early on, kind of those two daughter cells, instead of thinking, oh, hey, I'm two cells on team Mark. What they do is it's like, they almost, they, they almost like great to see themselves as individuals. Like instead of getting the idea like, oh, I'm a descent of the zygote, they, they kind of, there's a developmental cue in there that, that changes that causes them to see themselves as zygotes themselves. 
in which case they start to follow this sort of zygotic pattern. So you have two different developmental pathways in parallel with each other. And genetically they're the same, right? Because that's what mitosis does. And so that's usually what identical twins are. That's the reason why they're genetically the same. However, um, even for them, it's not the same, is it? Because one genetic twin isn't going to have the same recombinational patterns going on in them that their identical twin does. So if you were to look at like the sperm or the eggs of two identical twins, they would still be very genetically different because they they're independent events, right? This is the great thing about randomization. Genetics, like twinning, is about carbon copying, right? But randomization is about shuffling and has nothing to do with that. So for instance, twins will have a genetic similarity to them, right, a, a sameness to them. But all the random stuff is all different between them. And all the stuff we just talked about is all random. So when one twin goes to produce their gametes, it's gonna be a completely different assortment of gametes that they move forward than that their identical twin moves forward. So this is the reason why twins typically have kids that look different, not the same, is because they are, their, their, their recombination doesn't look any different than like if you just had two siblings that were not twins because it's all randomized, right? Is there a question over here somewhere? Late, was that you? It's already there. Yep. I just did it right before class. Yeah, yeah, they're there. They're there now. <coughs> so basically, when you take a look at the features that make meiosis distinct, really, it's these pairing, synapsis, crossing over, right? Those are the big three. That's what sets it all apart. Of course, we already talked about this, right? But there's no replication in between meiosis one and meiosis two because it's not two divisions. It's one division with two steps, all right? So you don't go through another cell cycle in between them. Okay. Sometimes that kind of confuses students a little bit. They're like, well, wait a minute, do we go through replication in G1? And that's, no, 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 right? It's one, it's one division. It just has two steps to it. Okay, so this is an M, this is the M phase. Meiosis one and two are all part of the M phase in meiosis. Okay, that is the end of 11. So now we've got some of the mechanistic stuff out of the way. Now we're gonna start talking about genetics. So a couple of things I wanna talk about a little bit. I'm gonna insert a slide here. I'm gonna add something. I wanna kind of take a little bit of historical backdrop because I wanna pull a few things together first before we start launching forward um, into genetics. And so one of the things I want to look at is some thoughts on inheritance, right? So what we're talking about now is, uh, so meiosis is the mechanism for genetics. Now we didn't know that back then, but we know that now. And so to understand um, the genetics chapter well, we wanna understand how meiosis works. It kind of helps us to understand some of the underpinnings of that. Before we get there, um, I want to take a look a little bit about kind of where we were here in the 19th century. Because when we start talking about this guy right here, um, who's the father of genetics, I mean, he was doing his work like in the 1860s, right? So the question is, I mean, 1860 seems an awful late in the game to start coming up with some of the stuff. Because think about it, right? I mean, intuitively, we kind of already knew a lot about genetics, didn't we? I mean, do you bear a resemblance to your parents? Yeah right? Uh, do they bear a resemblance to theirs, right? I mean, so we have some intuitive knowledge of how some of this stuff works. Um, and we, and we, we've done a lot, actually, for a very, very long time. And just to kind of sort of drive home 
sort of this idea of like how long we've been at this and like how how much we've known for how long a period of time it's kind of a fascinating story that um, I always like to recount because a lot of times people don't even realize that it's there that genetics has actually been mentioned actually at all um, in antiquity but um, I like to always recite a story from ancient literature um, the only one that I can find so far I haven't found anything in like um, you know the Assyrian texts or the epic of Bil Gilgamesh things like that um, is the clearest example in antiquity of, of what is essentially a interestingly and amazingly very modern genetic experiment that occurred long, long ago. Exactly how long ago, I don't know, but basically it involves a story about one of the um, old Jewish patriarchs, Jacob, right, uh, for whom the country of Israel is named after. Um, but Jacob, as the story goes, was a young guy in this particular story. And he was kind of uh, at that age where he was wanting to get married and he had his eye on uh, a young lady that he wanted to marry. And so, of course, he approached her father. That's what you did back in those days and asked permission, right? Can I marry your daughter? That kind of thing. And uh, the, guy, the guy's name was Laban. And he, so he said, okay, fine, fine. You can go ahead and marry my daughter. But before you do that, before I okay on this, you got to work for me for seven years, All right? So like you've got to put in your dues. It was a different world back in those days. Um, the story's actually even worse because Jacob totally got duped and screwed and, and uh, totally would have unionized on him. But anyway, um, but in this particular case, what happens is uh, they were shepherds, right? So this is kind of what they did back in those days. And that's what Jacob was, a shepherd. And in the, there's lots of stories of Jacob in various parts of the Old Testament. Uh, almost all of them uh, usually picture Jacob as a very intelligent guy, a very shrewd um, thinker, um, usually. Um, not that, you know, all the rest of them are a bunch of dupes, but I mean, there was, he had a particular shrewdness to him. And you kind of read into the, some of the stories about Jacob. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. <laughs> um, but Basically, what he did was Jacob was a smart guy, and, uh, and, and he basically said, okay, fine, I'll go ahead and work for you. I'll raise your sheep. And then uh, Laban proposed wages for Jacob, and he said, okay, fine, here's your wages. This is what I'm going to give you. You want my daughter, right? You're going to work for me for seven years, right? Okay, here's what I'm going to pay you. Take it or leave it. I'm going to give you all the worthless sheep. Those are your wages. And you're going to give me all the good ones. I like that. But wait, 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 wait. That's not fair. What, do you want my daughter or not? Right? He's kind of screwed, right? Kind of has him over a barrel there. Okay, so that's kind of what he did. And, and back in those days, the, the reason why they, they raised sheep for a lot of reasons back in those days. I mean, if you take a look at livestock, it wasn't just like for meat and stuff like that. It was, livestock was like everything, you know? I mean, it was milk and clothing and just about everything. I mean, it was your lifeline. And in this particular case, um, they were raising it for textiles, right? So wool in particular. And the desirable wool of the day was a white wool. And the reason why they liked white wool was because you could take the white wool, you could weave it, just you could do it with any wool actually, uh, but then you could stain it really well, right? White wool was nice and pure. And so you could add a stain to it and you would create these nice, beautiful stained fabrics. And then you'd be able to make lots of money, right? Think. Um, uh, you know, big kind of like fabric, you know, gurus and things like that that are making all these crazy fabrics and, and people love them. And that's kind of what Laban wanted, right? So for him, white was valuable, but then there was a certain number of sheep that always came out as they oftentimes do. And they either came out as brown or they had like brown spots on them or things like that, right? And those were considered undesirable, right? Because you couldn't, you couldn't get rid of the brown spots. If you stained it, you would just have like what looked like a big chocolate stain on your clothes. That's kind of what the brown spot would look like. So they couldn't get rid of it. So those were the sheep that Laban was given to Jacob for his wages. So talk about a backhand, right? So here's the thing though, Jacob was a smart guy. So what he noticed was when he took some of these spotted sheep and mated them with other spotted sheep, every now and then out would come a nice little white lamb. And so he was smart enough to realize that, you know, I'm gonna take this white lamb, I'm gonna separate it. So I'm going to start slowly. Every time I pop out a little white sheep, I'm going to separate them out and I'm going to keep the two flocks separate and I'm going to grow my white flock and I'm going to use my so-called worthless flock to basically grow them. 
And it's fascinating because if you read the story, there's like real a lot of detail, actually amazing that you would put a lot that much detail in there about this sort of thing, but there is, so it's interesting. But there's like this entire thing about how he did this. Like he was like taking sticks of some sort. I don't know what they were, right? And he's like, you know, kind of like braiding them and sort of like chopping them up. And it was like, it was like sheep Viagra, you know, it was like a, an aphrodisiac. So he kind of like wave it around the little sheep's nose. And this allowed him to be able to say, okay, I want this guy to mate with this girl. And so I'm going to get a purposeful mating. And he was using these sheep aphrodisiacs in their food to get them to form favorable parents. And that would get him his, his sheep. And it was a fascinating kind of a story because when I looked at that at the time, I was at UC Davis in a fly lab and literally the exact same things that he was doing, we were doing in the lab in terms of intentional mating, trying to get one thing to mate with another and trying to basically look for that one particular, we call it the exceptional female, that one exceptional female, that one that you're looking for, the white sheep and separating that and putting that one in its own little vial. We're doing the exact same thing at UC Davis in the nineties. And here Jacob had been doing it thousands of years ago, however long he lived, right? But certainly more than a few thousand, right? And I thought it was fascinating because, um, and by the way, apparently if you want to know what, how the story ends, essentially Jacob would got so good at this that uh, Laban actually accused him of stealing a sheep. Um, to which of course, Jacob pretty much said, listen, old man, I can't tell, I can't help it if you're too stupid to know what you've got. So get your hands off my sheep or there's going to be trouble. Um, and yeah, that, that was my phrase. He didn't really do the old man part, but it was a little bit of back and forth between them, um, which is never a good thing to do when you're kind of starting up the father-in-law relationship. It's like, um, but anyway, he did actually married both of his daughters. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, and by the way, if you're into uh, Jewish history, not that you are, but the famous tribes of Israel that they kind of organized themselves into, which to this day, they are still organized into. Um, those 12 tribes of Israel were the sons of Jacob. And that's the reason why Jacob was one of the patriarchs of the Jewish, um, the Jewish people. Fascinating story, right? Because it, come, it brings us here now to the 19th century. When we look back on that, and that was thousands of years ago, we'd improved on that as we went, you know, as we kind of continued on. So we've got to take a look at the 19th century, look back and we ask this question. So if we've known how to do this sort of stuff for like thousands of years, then what's different about this, right? I mean, what changed here, right? Why does this guy get a chapter in the book and not Jake? Right. Well, actually, Jacob does get a chapter. He gets several chapters, actually, in the first book of the Old Testament. But so he kind of gets his own. Um, but Mendel, um, who ironically being a monk, was probably well acquainted with Jacob, to be quite honest with you. Um, right. What happened here? Right. We've known these things for a long, long, long time. So what changed here? Right. So that's kind of like a little bit of historical backdrop. So here's something we knew a lot about. But something changed here and I want to sort of focus a little bit on on what's happening and it's really simple right Jacob never asked how does this work he didn't say huh how did I get that white sheep he never asked that question he just like hey you got a white sheep I can make money with this right so it was a different view different lens that's all he cared about nobody really cared about how it worked they just knew it did until now so when we're asking that question, or the scientific method question, what's the difference between asking why is the leaf green, right? It's whether or not you're asking it in a scientific manner, right? Like a scientist says, why is the leaf green? What he wants to know is really mechanistically, how does this work? What are the molecules at play here that are causing this greenness? The poet is asking, why is it green? It's like an existential question, right? It's like a philosophical question. They don't care about the answer. They just kind of want you to sort of ruminate, meditate. It's like, whatever. 
It's like, how about we get the chlorophyll out, right? And we start actually breaking down the molecules and start talking about reflectance of light and absorbance of light, right? And that's the question that a scientist, and that's what we're asking here. It wasn't asking, does this work? We knew it worked. We started asking, well, wait a minute, why does this work? Mechanistically, how is this happening? That's the new question that we had here. So as we move into the 19th century, <coughs> I want to cover a couple of thoughts on inheritance. Some of them are outright quackery, and others seem like quackery, but they weren't at the time. So let's take a look here. First one I want to talk about is sperm mate. That's great. Okay, well, so what is sperm man? Well, sperm man basically is the idea that you kind of had this like little baby in the head of a sperm. Fully formed, all you had to do is plant the seed and then off it grow into a large adult and then boom, there you got it. All right. Uh, by the way, there's a, a version of this for the egg as well. So like maybe probably a little girl in there. And they also had a version of this for like, um, tree. The idea called a homunculus. It's actually a technical name for it. Um, but basically, this is an idea that we actually used to think this, right? There was actually a fully formed tree inside the seed. And then when you planted the seed, basically the, the tree would like hatch. And then it would just start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So that's kind of what you were seeing was this, essentially the fully formed tree was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we had no concept whatsoever of development. This is early. So this is like well before the 19th century, probably was discredited about 100 years before moving into the 19th century. Part of it is because of bad technology. So you're going to think of, you know, bad eyesight combined with bad microscopes is not a good mix. So you can imagine you could probably see all sorts of things. Um, even today, right, a lot of times when you're looking at a microscope, you see your floaters. Okay. Anybody know what your floaters are? Yeah, like the little chunks that are floating around in your eye. You can see them like if you just look at a white field and you can kind of see them floating by or if you kind of look at the blue sky and just kind of, you can see them floating by. Well, if you're looking at a microscope, guess what? You're probably gonna see like your little floating and you can try to look at them and it kind of moves around like with your eyes so you can't ever really get a good look at it. So there's probably some of that in there. There's probably a lot of misinterpretation to be quite honest with you in cell biology that associated with floaters because we didn't have any clue that floaters, what they were that they existed, um, but that's just kind of a common thing, right? So now as we age, we just kind of get used to seeing our floaters, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about floaters, right? Um, if you're wondering what those are, by the way, don't freak out. It's not like your eyeballs are falling apart or dissolving in your sockets. Um, all floaters are basically is like construction debris from development. It's basically leftover retinal tissue that's just in the vitreous humor. As you're young, when you're young, your vitreous humor is kind of a solid, so it doesn't move around, right? So you don't see a lot of floaters, but as you get older, your vitreous humor starts to liquefy more. So the floaters start to dislodge and start to move around more as you get older. So that's just like the leftover debris from retinal development. So that's all that is. So you're not going blind, don't worry, right? Um, it just can be annoying sometimes. So this one was basically uh, put to rest with better technology, better science, right? And the reason why I like this one is because this is a cautionary tale for us. Because I can tell you right now, in 100 years, we're going to get better technology. We're going to get more ability to do different experiments and to make the different measurements. And we're going to be able to look back on the things that we have now. We're going to be a laugh at ourselves. And we're going to say, like, how did you guys ever believe that? Well, I mean, with our limited technology, this is as good as we could do. Right. So in the course of time, when technology improves, we'll be able to clean that up and modify it, eliminate it. if It's crazy talk. Right. Or develop it if it's not. OK, that's just something happened. Every generation of scientists laughs hysterically at the previous generation. It has happened since the dawn of time. It just is. Trust me. Just when we think we're so smart, we will be the butt of the joke within a generation. The boomers already are. And they're still alive and destroying the world. Sorry. As a latchkey kid, the descendants, the offspring of the boomers, uh, yeah, I have words for the boomers. 
don't retire, implement your mandatory euthanasia that you were all for, starting with you. <laughs> that sounds brutal. Like, you like that? I got generational warfare there going on there. A little bit of bitterness. By the way, that's a totally generational thing too, right? The, the Gen Xers, right? The latchkey kids, we totally have a chip on our shoulder. Uh, almost every Gen Xer does. Um, just there's a bigger chip on some of our shoulders. Right. So I can't speak for the other ones because honestly, I have no idea what's going on. But um, what's the next one? talked about this one didn't we spontaneous generation <coughs> crazy talk yes this is basically the idea that living things can come from non-living matter sound crazy oh yeah sounds really crazy right my high school biology professor, teacher, professor, whatever, teacher, hack, um, basically flippantly once said, uh, yeah, this is basically the idea that, um, you know, if a rock looks like a frog, it's going to turn into a frog. Um, that's a little too ignorant and idiotic. Because one of the things I don't like about it is it basically does what we always do, right? We laugh. It's a joke. It's a tease. You're making fun of the previous generation. Oh, look at these idiots, these fools, whoever believed in a spontaneous generation. Look how stupid that is. Look how stupid they are. Let's all laugh at them and scorn them and basically treat them as less than human. Let me tell you something. There were some actually pretty well-educated people, I can guarantee you, in the 19th century that were signed on to this. Because for all this preposterousness now, it was actually a pretty rational explanation. Think about it. Instead of talking about the rock and the frog, which is idiocy, let's go for a hike first, right? And uh, on this hike, I'm gonna stop you at this big boulder, this big rock, and on it is gonna be this kind of crusty green growth. What am I looking at? Lichen, right? Which is a living system. It's actually a symbiotic system, right? Involving algae, right? Which is photosynthetic. Um, and so there are three forms of lichen. There's what's called the crustose form, which is what we're looking at on the rock, the kind of the crusty green stuff on it. It almost looks like a dried salt deposit sometimes, right? Like you just sort of spilled a bunch of salt water on there and kind of dried and it's all crusty on there, right? Then there's all folios, which basically has folios, kind of has outgrowths on it that look kind of leafy-like. And then there's fruticose, which has like fruiting bodies, just like little fruiting bodies of, of um, these particular structures. <laughs> now imagine you're looking at this rock, you're looking at this lichen sample and you're looking around and you're thinking, hmm, I don't see anything on the ground. There's nothing on the trees. There's nothing around the base of the rock. I don't see any evidence of this anywhere. All I see it is on this little patch of the rock right here. That's it. So where did it come from? I see no evidence of it anywhere. Maybe somehow the rock transformed into the lichen. That would be a form of spontaneous generation. Oh, I hear you laughing. Um, let me give you exhibit A to justify my rationale. I've seen just as comical and preposterous conversions before, and yet they exist. I've seen and well-documented the caterpillar that has basically gone through a worm-like existence, retreat into its cocoon, and then out comes as right the butterfly. Is there any way I could have predicted that? To me, remember, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an entomologist here. Is there any way I could predict? Is there any way that I could say like, this one actually looks like a caterpillar? No, right? The butterfly looks like nothing absolutely related to the caterpillar. It's like magic, right? 
And this is the, the metamorphosis really stumped us for a long time because that's actually what we, we saw it as like a biological magic box. I mean, you went into it and then poof, out comes this amazing thing that has nothing to do with it. So wait a minute, I've actually seen this happen. I've followed this, I've grown them, I've raised them. I've got a membership to Butterfly Pavilion, <laughs> which I actually do, but go Rosie, right? They have one in Rosie, Butterfly Pavilion? Yeah, up on uh, 104, I think. Yep, it's a nice one. But, um, right, so here's the idea. I've seen the transform transformation from one living thing to a completely unrelated living thing that was like a dramatic, like nothing, like night and day. So is it such a log leap of logic to hypothesize that maybe there is a mechanism by which something non-living can transform into something living? Logically, the rationale is exactly the same. If it is logically true for one, it could be logically true for the other. In terms of logic and rationale, there's no difference between those two lines of reasoning. So it looks good. It sounds compelling. It's rational, right? It has explanatory power, which means it explains some of the things we see. Not only that, but guess what? This was not necessarily a bad idea, but it is all like all of our scientific ideas. All of our scientific day ideas, generally speaking, are not based on knowledge or based on ignorance because our best hypotheses are only based on what we know, but more importantly, it's limited. We don't know. It's called honest ignorance, not stupidity, honest ignorance. We simply don't know. We haven't learned that yet. Okay. There's no harm, no foul there. And the same thing was true here, right? It, by the way, this persisted in the 19th century, well into the 19th century. It took actually Louis Pasteur of microbiology fame, the father of microbiology. He had to create the sterile technique, much of which we've been practicing in COVID. Washing of hands, gloving up, masking up, keeping everything ultra clean, right? That's all sterile technique. Louis Pasteur had to reinvent that in order to finally demunk this one. Because this one had legs, right? Because if you think about it, Somebody who's like looking at a piece of meat on the table, they just see a piece of meat. But then all of a sudden they see worms starting to crawl around them. And they're like, I've been watching this thing. And I, ne I never saw any worms crawl up to it. No worms are ever around it. Where'd they come from? A rational hypothesis would be that maybe somehow the meat spontaneously transformed into the worms. Of course, you're not an entomologist, right? So you don't have any knowledge of the entomological life cycles of, of insects, right? Of the egg, larval stage, and then go pupation, and then the adult. So you don't make a connection between the flies crawling around on the meat, laying microscopic eggs on the meat. You don't make that connection because that's knowledge you don't have. This is the reason why it persisted well into the 19th century. Yeah, they don't. Um, right, because there's, I mean, there's got to be a biological mechanism underneath it all. Right, and that's kind of what ultimately the lesson that we were learning at this particular time. But when this was debunked, because Louis Pasteur was like mid 19th century, right? So when Mendel was alive working on his stuff, I can guarantee you there were scholars who were legit, not quacks, not part of the Flat Earth Society, right? But legit, who probably still signed on to spontaneous generation. That's just the way it works. Once you debunk an idea, it usually takes a little while for it to work itself out. And so the reason why I like this is because it's a cautionary tale. This is one of the reasons why I start this tale off at the beginning of the semester, right? Never fall in love with your idea. Why? Because even though it's compelling, it's rational, it's got good evidence to it, 
right? It's logical, it's got explanatory power. All those are good things. Nevertheless, it's wrong. Sound familiar? Like the ones I always like to pick on are the endosymbiosis theories, right? Because they're impossibly like knowable because they're so far back, right? So this is a good example, right? I mean, you've got well-reasoned, rationalized models that sound compelling, that have good explanatory power, everything about them sounds good, but so did spontaneous generation. That's the reason why I always talk in caveats. I always say, listen, this isn't the way it is. This is one of potential possibilities that we think it is. It could all be wrong, right? Because we have been proven wrong before. It happens every generation. Um, guess what? This generation's spontaneous generation is T Rex proteins, right? That's another one, right? When we kind of get to this point in science where it's like, okay, we know how this works. And then we do some sort of an experiment. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't anything like we thought it worked. So now we have to kind of go back and refigure everything out. Right. I love those moments in science. It keeps us honest. Okay. Let's take a look at blending inheritance. So blending inheritance basically is a situation where traits are blended together like paint. So basically, I'm going to take some Snapdragons. Yes, I know those of you who are well aware of what a Snapdragon looks like, this is not anything close to a Snapdragon. I cannot draw a Snapdragon. They're irregular in shape. Uh, and I'm not an artist. So this is my Snapdragon, right? So in this case, what happens is you take a red Snapdragon, you cross it to a white one. And what you end up getting is, <laughs> Makes sense, right? What happens if you take red paint and white paint and mix it together? What do you get? Pink, right? So what did you do? You blended them together. So just to kind of kick it up a notch here, let's go ahead and cross a pink to a pink. And what do we get here? What we get is red, white, and pink, all three. Okay, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Okay, so here's what the blenders are thinking. They're seeing this red and white equals pink. So naturally they're thinking, okay, hey, perfect, right? It's blending. We know how to how this works. Um, you take uh, red paint and white paint, you mix together, you get pink, right? You take blue paint and some yellow paint and you mix together and you get green, right? Yeah, not only that, but if you take green and mix it with the green, what do you got? Still green. If you take that green, mix it with some more Green, what do you got? So do you ever get your blue back? Do you ever get your yellow back? No, right? So you're forever green, aren't you? Well, this piece here, the blenders didn't ha have a problem with. They had a way to explain how you red and white gets pink. What they couldn't understand, however, is how when you mix pink and pink, or like green and green, you get pink or green, but you also get yellow and blue back. They had no idea how that works, right? And a lot of people say like, well, wait, 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 wait. Aren't you kind of being a little too like um, didactic here? You're kind of being a little sort of a little offish just for the sake of explanation because they didn't really think of this as paint. No, that's exactly how they thought of it. You know why? Back in the 19th century, They thought of everything in terms of what we refer to as humors, actually what they refer to as humors. And basically what your humors are is essentially your body fluids. This is what they thought. So they literally thought that the male body fluids, semen for instance, would be mixed with the female body fluids. And just like paint, the traits that were in the male fluids would mix with the female fluids and the traits would mix just like paint and you would get an intermediate look. A little bit of mom, a little bit of dad, gave you kind of mom dadish somewhere in between, right? 
That's exactly the way they thought about it. Because they thought a physiologist, this was a physiological idea actually, that the physiologists were way into is this concept of humor. As a matter of fact, we have some holdovers today from this era. Um, here's a good example of it, right? I'm gonna ask you two questions and I want you to tell me what I'm asking you. Do you have a good sense of humor? What am I asking you? Are you funny, right? Or can you take a joke, right? Can you laugh? How about this one? Slightly different, sounds very similar, but slightly different. Are you in good humor? What am I asking you? Are you in a good mood, right? But notice humor is relating to body fluids. Back in this day, everything they used to attribute to the body fluids. So for instance, all of your mental health, body fluids, all of your emotions, body fluids, your sense of humor, whether you're funny, body humor, whether you're angry person, body, that's your humor, that's your body fluids. All of it was your humors. Not only that, if you got sick, humors. You had some sort of a negative contagion in your humors. So how do they fix that? Very easy, drain it out. This is where the idea of bloodletting comes from, right? So the idea is if you've got a lot of bad contagion, usually you bloodlet somebody who's sick, right? You got a lot of bad contagion in your humors. Then the idea is if you were able to sort of drain out the badness of the humors, seal back up, then the individual would be able to rebuild their humors in a better stance. Right? That's basically how they looked at it. So what they do, they'd wrap you up, they'd slice a vein, they'd bleed you out a little bit. The idea is hopefully you're getting rid of all the bad stuff, the sickness, and they seal you back up. And then you'll be able to rebuild yourself and you're going to ride as rain. So they weren't just bloodletting because they were barbaric. There was actually a rationale. There was actually like a medical, reasonable rationale for bloodletting. There was also a lot of, uh, shall we say, grotesque therapeutics, I say that in air quotes, for mental health, right? The asylums, they were not pleasant places to be. Um, insane asylums were not like, oh, well, you get to go in, check into a mental health institution, and they're gonna help you kind of deal with your, whatever your mental health issue was. And it's going to be great because you're going to get medical care and you're going to have, that's kind of what it is like today. Back in those days, if you had some sort of a mental health challenge, you, uh, stay free. Don't let them catch up to you because um, they're going to throw you in a sane mile. And if you're noticed on those ghost shows, like all the scariest places are what? Yeah, those old insane asylums, right? Because they used to kill people there. I mean, their approach to therapy was brutal, right? Part of it is because they just said, oh, well, you just have bad humors. It's kind of like you're a bad seed, right? I mean, there's this idea back in that day that it is possible for you to just be a substandard, wretched human being just because you just happen to get bad humors, right? And of course, then what they would say is that, oh, there's no way to fix this. So we're just going to chain you up because you know, mentally you're scary or something like that. And then they just chain you to your bed and then there you'd be a prisoner and they'd probably abuse you. And, and then that's the reason why all those scariest places are in those systems I do. I, I just, you know, pre presumably because you've got lots of abuse there, a history of bad things happening. Orphanages not too far away from asylums. Right, there's a reason why we got rid of orphanages. <clears throat> so that's what they did, right? So they could explain this, but they couldn't explain this down here. Now, the particular people believed in unit factors of inheritance. <clears throat> Discrete packages, if you will, that informed a particular trait. So for instance, when they saw the red and the white, what they would see is they would see like, okay, this makes sense to me. We've got some sort of a discrete page of instructions that encodes whiteness, right? These are instructions for white. 
And then we over here have a discrete page or set of instructions for redness, right? Whatever that entails. Now, where the particular people couldn't figure it out is that how can you cross red and white and you get something, something completely different, right? That's your pink. They saw pink as not an amalgam of red and white. They saw pink as a completely different set of instructions that just came out of nowhere, right? Like just materialized out of thin air. That's where they got stuck. They didn't have a problem with this part down here because once you have pink, of course you're gonna get red, white, and pink back, right? But what they didn't understand is how did you get pink in the first place, right? So this is like, just almost like materialized, like out of nowhere, right? Like Star Trek style, right? Beam me down, Scotty, that kind of thing. Right, just kind of materializes out of nowhere. It's like, well, where did this paint come from? That's kind of where they have this. this. This was the nature of the argument that was happening in the 19th century. <coughs> Darwin himself was working on blending. He was wrong. And that's why he gave up. Uh, Mendel, however, took a different approach. He was a particulate guy. And so he turned out to be right. So, Let's take a look at some of the early work then as we lead up to Mendel and what Mendel was doing. Uh, first of all, I wanna draw your attention to some dates here, right? Being the history buff that I am, of course, I never miss an opportunity to talk a little history. Why? Because I, for one, you may be different, but I personally don't wanna repeat the same mistakes that we made in the past. That's just dumb. However, many of us across the globe, probably the majority of us, 8 billion, are perfectly content basically walking down the same broken pathways that we've already proven to be disastrous. Why? Because we're not very smart. But let's take a look at this, right? So we're talking about the end of the 18th century. Now, Kohlreuter starts it off. And Kohlreuter basically was a tobacco guy, right? So he was not a geneticist. You wouldn't link him or call him a geneticist. That's not what he was interested in. What basically Kohlreuter was doing was growing tobacco. That's all he was doing. And he was trying to create the perfect tobacco strain, right? He does basically what everybody else does, what every other farmer does. And basically you're trying to create the biggest, baddest, best crop you can so that when you sell it to market, everybody wants to buy yours and not your competitors, right? That way you make lots of money and nobody else does. It's just all yours, right? And so you're constantly looking for the best strain. And you can still see this, uh, uh, by the way, in, in tobacco shops and things of that nature. I mean, you can see there's lots of competition, obviously, just within cigarettes. If you go into a tobacco shop and you actually buy your tobacco um, individually, you can see there's lots of different types of tobacco in there. And th that's kind of what Colorado is doing. He's basically saying, hey, you want the Colorado blend because I have this new hybrid that nobody else has that gives you, you know, better whatever, you know, it's like whatever your claim is, it gives you better experience as a tobacco consumer. And that's what he was going for, right? So that's, that's, the, that's his whole purpose. So what he noticed was that when he crossed his tobacco strains, he generated hybrids. But these hybrids, he noticed, were different from the parents, right? Now, first of all, the fact that these hybrids were different from the parents immediately contradicted and debunked an idea that was around at that time called direct transmission. What direct transmission basically said was that your parents give you a carbon copy of their chromosomes, which we now know is not right, right? But that was direct transmission. So basically, where do the hybrids come from? Recombination, random assortment, right? Random fertilization. So all those things we talked about in meiosis, that's where that randomness is coming from, the reason why they're not the same. Kohlreuter was the first one to notice that that there is not such a thing as direct transmission. You are not a carbon copy of your parents. We used to actually think that. The other thing he noticed was that when he crossed the hybrids together, he got even more variation in the next generation, the second generation of offspring. So you're increasing your variation now. So that's a good thing, right? Because remember, according to Paul Ryder, the more variation you have, the more likely you're going to strike on a really good hybrid that's going to really sell well to your tobacco consumers. And that's what he's going for. So he did make a couple of really important initial discoveries. Now, in uh, the early part of the 19th century, so around 1823-ish or so, 
1823, basically at this point, Beethoven was still alive, just to give you an idea. Um, he was gonna be alive for another year. I think he died in 1824, but he was still there. <coughs> Not in good shape, probably at this point, full on death um, at this point. But he was around. Notice, um, if you come back to some of the previous chapters, you're talking about roughly um, 10 to 15 years before Schladen and Schwann were working on the cell theory, right, of 1839. Roughly um, about 40-ish plus, 40, 45 years before Darwin publishes his paper, right, um, on the transmutation of species by natural selection. So basically what you've got is sort of the beginnings of essentially what would be important for genetics. Now, what T.A. Knight did was basically use the garden pea, Pisum cytivum, and uh, he kind of got the system started. So one of the first things that he did that was important was he created true breeding strains, right? So basically a true breeding strain was essentially a strain like we talked about in the genetics lab, right? To basically breed true for its trait. So if I've got a purple flower plant and I cross it to a purple flower plant, then I get purple, right? And if I take another purple and a purple, I get, so it's only breeding true for purple. So what this does is this minimizes complexity in variables. Very important in science. Never deal with 20 variables that are moving at the same time. You're never gonna solve the puzzle. You start with one variable at a time and keep all the other static. It's the same thing with a puzzle, right? You don't solve a puzzle by trying to put 20 pieces in at a time. You solve it one piece at a time, right? That's exactly what you do in science. By doing this, it eliminated extra variables. So you knew that your purple true reader only had the information, whatever that was, for purple. That's it, okay? So that was important. And then when he crossed these guys, he. Basically, these true breeders were what's called the parental generation. So these are the true breeders. And then he crosses these parentals, say for instance, a purple flower to a white flower pea plant. And then what he got in the first generation was that your first generation only looked like one of the parents. So in this first generation, we call it the F1 or the first filial generation. So we first pillar. So these are the kids. Now, he took it a step further. He did what Kohlreiter did, only now he's kind of paying attention, a little more so than Kohlreiter, because Kohlreiter is distracted by economics and growth and stuff. So. so then what he did was he crossed the two F1s together, and then he noticed that he got both of those parental looks back. So this is what is called your second filial generation. or your F2. Now, T.A. Knight didn't really know what to make of this. He did see the pattern, however, and he did lay down some really important stuff about pea plants and how to use pea plants and how to sort of streamline this sort of stuff. And the important thing about this is from this, Mendel basically launched off. Now, the reason why I like this historical background kind of lead up is because it drives home a really, really critical message to all of us in general society and also in scientific society. Because in society, we tend to deify one person for something stupendous, right? Take a look at the Nobel Prize. I mean, usually one up to three people will get the Nobel Prize at once, that's it. But they didn't actually come up and wake up one morning and just do the Nobel Prize winning experiment. Generally speaking, if you look closely at every single Nobel Prize, it's one. It is one because there is an entire group, an entire sector of researchers that were all working on it, adding little bits and pieces to the entire story that ultimately led to this one person getting the Nobel Prize. The same thing is true in history. Einstein is a good example, right? We all know and love Einstein for his theory of relativity. Fascinating theory. I personally love it myself. It's infinitely fascinating to me. But we always think, oh, yeah, Einstein's the one who came up with that, right? Well, he did. He worked on it, certainly. But it, he was not the only one. His wife, actually, the great unsung hero of the duo, did a lot of work on relativity as well. Nobody talks about her. There's a lot of Einstein's colleagues, actually, 
other physicists of that era that also worked on relativity that added a lot to that story, right? Einstein, when he won his Nobel Prize, a lot of times people think he won it for relativity. He didn't. He won it earlier. He came up with relativity after he won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize for a photo photoelectric effect. And so that's what he won it for. You're like, what? We'll talk about that. Um, right, but the photoelectric effect is what he wanted for. But if you take a look at that era, there's a lot of other people working on that that led to that discovery, like Max Planck, for instance, uh, who was a great German physicist in his own right, probably every bit Einstein's equal. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at Einstein's era, it's a fascinating era. It's probably one of the few moments in human history where we had like literally like the best and the brightest in physics, like just all right there. I mean, you guys, the guys like Niels Bohr, you had Ernst Schrodinger, you had Einstein, you had Max Planck. I mean, you had all these people. Uh, ironically, it was weird. It was like they had something in the water there because they were all German physicists. So there's something going on in Germany there um, that just belted out physicists somehow for some reason. But the, all these guys basically are geniuses in their own right. And when you study that entire group of individuals, all of a sudden, Einstein looks a little less, less deistic and a little more human, which is actually the way he was, right? I mean, we kind of like glorify Einstein, but he was just a guy. He was just a normal guy, a well-trained guy and a well-educated guy, but he was just a guy. You know, I mean, he struggled with quantum mechanics just like everybody else does. You know, he never figured that one out. Um, and so there was a lot of things that he struggled with. And a lot of things that the other German physicists figured out that he didn't. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Mendel's the same way, right? The, the story of that is that for every person you see on Mount Rushmore of science, there's an entire generation of researchers that basically built up to that. And so it is true that one of the phrases that we oftentimes say in research is that most people who have the humility to say it is that every good researcher, every successful researcher stands on the shoulders of giants. And that's, that's a phrase that was originally used in science and it's been used in other places as well. We use that phrase now in lots of different areas in life. That was originally used in, in science because it's true. Because when you see me standing up, you see me and it's like, look at me, right? But what you don't see is that I'm standing on the shoulders of somebody underneath me who made a significant contribution, that if they weren't there, I wouldn't be here. And they're standing on somebody else's shoulders, that if they weren't there, I wouldn't be here. So this is kind of like a cultural kind of a build project where everybody has a little bit of pull in the process. And that's the way science is. It's a cumulative effect where many people deserve the credit, not just one. That's the reason why I like this approach is because it's showing you some of the lead up. Usually the person who starts it doesn't get the credit for it. It's usually somebody usually toward the end or toward the near the middle to the end that gets all the credit for it, right? So here you can see, you start off slowly. And if it weren't for Cole Reuter, then Knight wouldn't have had the background to, to work with. If it weren't for Knight, then Mendel wouldn't have had the head start to be able to work with peas because Mendel himself chose peas as well for a good reason. Why? Because first of all, they're everywhere, right? Um, you can produce easy hybrids, that's good. They're easy to grow, gotta be easy to grow, right? And not only that, but you can manipulate their fertilization. So some plants, for instance, can actually either cross-fertilize or self-fertilize. Pea plants are this way. Corn is this way. This is the reason why corn is a big genetic organism, why we were counting corn is because there's been a lot of corn genetics and actually the lady who was sort of like the queen of corn genetics is a brilliant, brilliant woman in genetics um, who finally got the Nobel Prize after many, many years of much, much anger at the slighting of her because she was a woman. And that's totally what it was, uh, the sexist bastards of the 50s, basically. And that's me being nice to them actually. That, that wait until we get into replication I have some pretty angry words for many of those individuals. Two of them in particular that I go for the throat on and I don't back down. 
But the idea here is you use corn. Barbara McClintock used corn because corn can self. So like if you take a look at corn, you've got the tassels on the top, right? So these are tassels basically are the male parts or the pollen producing parts. And of course you have the corn stalk on the side. Typically you have one corn per plant and a corn plant can actually self-fertilize itself. So the pollen from the corn can actually fertilize its own corn. So it can self, that's self-fertilization or it can cross-fertilize other plants as well. So it can do both. Now pea plants can actually do both. of them, And that kind of leads us to where Mendel kind of broke in. So what he did basically was take what T.A. Knight started and sort of built on that foundation. And that kind of gets us to a little bit of a calibration. We kind of calibrated a correct view of Einstein. We also need to calibrate a correct view of Mendel, right? Because a lot of times we kind of see Mendel, we're thinking it's like, oh, he's cute. He's like a, a little Austrian monk. And uh, I don't know about you, I mean, I'm not Catholic, but um, I mean, I know enough about the monastic tradition that it has a history of hermetical types of living, right? So you go to a monastery, usually secluded, um, in this case, if it's Austria, what are you thinking of? Alps, right? So you're thinking of like rattling around somewhere in the great unknown, in the mountains somewhere, just in this hermetical type of lifestyle, completely out of touch with humanity, not even sure what century you're in, right? I mean, just completely disconnected. And then all of a sudden in that state, you get the sort of divine inspiration, right? The sort of spark or lightning bolt of, of divine inspiration. And you come up with all these genetics ideas and it's kind of like, you know, Amazing, right? <laughs> Nothing, that's not true, <laughs> right? Was he a monk? Yes. Was he an Austrian? Yes. But all the rest of it is not. I mean, he was not hermetical. As a matter of fact, if you want a really accurate view of probably what Mendel was like, Mendel was probably most like what we would consider today a university trained professor at Boulder, a researcher with his own lab. And think about what those professors are. They are well-educated, they are well-read, they are well-connected. So not only are they reading up on all the literature, what's going on with their research project, but they're reading up on all their colleagues. They know exactly what all their colleagues are doing. In a lot of ways, they know their colleagues individually by name. Most PIs, most professors at Boulder can call up whoever and say like, hey, Bob, can you send me a strain of flies? You have an extra strain of flies for FM7s? And he's like, yeah, I'll send them today, right? So they know each other. In many cases, they went to grad school together, right? And so, um, so they, they, there's a really well connected and they're really well informed. That's exactly what Mendel was like, right? So Mendel wasn't just some dummy that didn't know what was going on. Mendel knew exactly what Kohlreuter did in the 18th century. He knew exactly what T.A. Knight was doing with pea plants. Why do you think he chose it? He didn't just come up with this on his own. He knew what Darwin was doing with snapdragons and working on the blending inheritance and all of that, but they knew him. So there was this sense of interconnectedness. So when he sits down to try to attack genetics, it was with like full awareness of what everybody else in the world was doing on genetics and what we knew and what we didn't know. And his head monk guy, whatever you call that, um, is that what it is? And have it the, the head monk dude see that's you can tell I'm not Catholic because I probably would should have known that if I was I was Catholic perhaps. But they actually said, I think there was a story somewhere that I read where they he said that he, you know, they talked about it and 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 he agreed as like that meant that Gregor should, you know, pursue this genetic uh, experiment. So he was well connected. <coughs> He's no dummy. <clears throat> so let's take a look and see what he did. So first of all, he just picked up right where T.A. Knight left off. So he generated his true breeding strains, right? And then of course, in this particular case, um, he fertilized them, but he did something that T.A. Knight didn't do. He created what's called reciprocal crosses. So if you take a reciprocal cross, this is what it basically means. If I take, say for instance, a red or a purple, let's do a purple, because I want to talk about peas now, right? Red versus, or purple versus white, and you cross them together. Let's say in one case, I'm gonna take a red male and cross it to a white female. A reciprocal cross would be just do the opposite, flip it around. Let's say, what if I take a red female and cross it to a red male? That's a reciprocal cross. So what are you asking here? Is there a parent of origin effect? Does it matter? 
if your red is coming from your dad or your mom? Generally speaking, the answer is it doesn't matter. Ah, oh, yes. But later on in the 20th century, which we'll learn about in the genetics class if you take it in the fall, is there actually is a difference for some genes if they're coming through mom versus dad. I'll leave that at that. Tease that. So I'm, I'm going to try to tease as much of the genetics class as possible because right now I've got one person in it. And if that class isn't filled up to eight people, then I'm going to have to teach A and B too. Um, which my AMP1 students are already threatening to like register for the genetics class and then drop at the last minute to force me to teach AMP2 because they want me to teach AMP2. So I told them, it's like, don't do that to me, please. Because they may never run genetics again if it doesn't run in the fall. <coughs> Which is unfortunate because you can see like the centrality of genetics and biology is a big deal, but it's a long time. That's just very much a very recent shift in paradigm. So then basically then what you can do is you can essentially take these and sort of create these hybrids. You can either self-fertilize, you can cross-fertilize. But one of the things that Mendel actually did was a horticultural trick, which we still use today actually in horticulture. <coughs> this is basically manipulated crossing. So think about this one for a second. Let's say right here that we want a purple, we're looking at flower color now, but we want the purple to be a female cross to a white male. Think about this for a second. First of all, one complication, pea plants can self. That means they can fertilize themselves. That's a problem. <laughs> um, the other thing is uh, pollinators are not very cooperative. Uh, there's really two dominant ways of pollination, either wind pollination, like corn, for instance, where you see all the pollen sort of blowing off the tassels, or insect pollination. Right. Either way, it's random, and that's not a good thing. So you want to be a little more intentional about that. So here's how you do it. Let's take a look at some of the flower sex organs here, first of all. So basically what you have here are what's called the anthers. These are the male structures. These are what creates the pollen grains, which is like the male um, gamete. And then here is what's called the carpal or the female structure. So I'm going to draw the carpal here like a picture. Some of these actually do look like pictures. So here you'll see, you've got like little ova inside these little chambers. These are eggs. Now generally what happens is a pollen grain will basically land on the stigma. So you have a stigma right here, which is the top part and the style, which is the neck. So together, this is the carpal. Now what happens when your pollen grain lands on this sort of stigma, the stigma has kind of like a little stickiness to it. Uh, you can actually see this, by the way, especially lilies. Lilies are great. It's still close enough to Easter where there might be some lilies out there. Those are really good ones to look at because they got those little stigma. If you look at the surface of them, you can see they got a little sticky to them. Right? So what happens is the pollen grain lands on that sticky part. It goes through mitosis and it creates a long tube called the pollen tube. And then the male gamete, the male nucleus, goes down that pollen tube and then fuses with that female egg. And that creates the zygote. Of course, you're going to create lots of different pollen grains lots of different tubes for each one of these. Okay. That's the problem because if you get wind blown pollen, you're gonna get random mating, right? Which is a good thing for variation, but not for this one, right? We wanna control it. So what you do is you basically take off from your female donor, you cut off the anthers. So it cannot self fertilize. And then you take a paintbrush and you pick up the pollen from your donor male, which is the white male, and you brush it on the sticky stigma surface. That then will ensure that you get the delivery of the pollen that you want to the stigma that you want. This is something that actually horticulturists today still do. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody in horticulture does. Orchid people do this. Anytime somebody's trying to create hybrids or try to create some sort of a, a very specific type of an offspring, then this is a common technique. It's like horticulture 101. And Mendel was the first one to start it. Okay. So the other thing I want to do then is I want to take a look then at um, the monohybrid cross, which Mendel took a look at. And so what he was looking at was seven different traits, but each of these traits were binary, right? What does that mean? That means they were either or, right? Purple or white, no lavender. There, there's no intermediate phenotype in there. 
So what he did was he basically crossed these together to create the F1 generation, right? That's your F1. And then of course he got essentially um, that same thing that Kohlreuter saw, same thing that TA Knight saw. And so in this case, he saw they were all purple, in this case, if they're plant. But then he crossed that to the F2 and he noticed that he got a three to one ratio, right? A three to one ratio of purple to white. So when you take a look at your seven traits, this is what he saw. I'm gonna end with this slide here. So flower color, purple, white was 3.15. Yellow, green, 3.01. Round wrinkle, 2.96. Green, yellow, 2.82. Inflated versus constricted or puckered, 2.95 to one. 3.14 to one for axial versus terminal versus tall versus short is 2.84. Notice what you guys saw, right? The theoretical was three to one, but then the real data was not exactly three to one, was it, right? But it was close. So basically what we wanna do is, what I wanna do is I want to insert, and I'm gonna take a look at this, um, and we're gonna, I wanna start here next time. What I wanna do is I wanna go through what Mendel did and I want to see things the way Mendel saw them and not cheat ahead, right? Because we got all the answers in this textbook. Don't want to do that. So I want to take a look at the monohybrid cross. And I want to take a look at it with respect to scientific method. And so I want to see this as Mendel saw it without the answers ahead of time. And then I want us to reason through his data to see how we can easily come up with his conclusions just from what he saw. Okay. So that's what I want to do. And we'll do that next time.